Let's bow our heads for prayer. Loving Father, we thank you for the privilege of opening your word. We thank you for the promise of the Holy Spirit to guide us into truth. Help us to understand this very important book on Galatians, that we may be established on the rock Jesus Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, no one hates the gospel more than the Satan. He is the enemy of souls. And any person who accepts Christ as their personal savior, he will do his level best to destroy that person's faith and uh, bring them back into his kingdom, which is the world. And there are three basic ways he's been trying. The first one is persecution. And the persecution can, be, can come from any source, from within the church or from the world. It can come physically or mentally or so, you know, socially. I remember when I was chaplain of Nairobi University, the other students who had, no, had turned their backs on Christ, they would say to the, stu the, the believing student, they would say, you mean you still believe in that stuff that our parents believed in? They were peasant farmers, we know better. And that's a tremendous pressure they came under. The other way he tries to destroy your faith is by dangling the trinkets of this world. The love of money, Paul says, is the root of what? All evil. He doesn't say money is the root of all evil, but the love of it. Which some, having been trapped, destroy their faith. But the most successful method he has ever used to destroy the faith of God's people is to pervert the gospel. From the time he was converted, uh, to the time he was uh, on Damascus Road, to the time he was executed as a martyr for Christ, was approximately 30 years. During those 30 years, he made three very important missionary journeys and over, all over Asia Minor and established churches. After he had established churches and uh, uh, appointed elders to look after the church, a group of Jewish believers called Judaizers, they were believers, they believed in Jesus Christ, but they were mainly of Pharisee origin. They would come to these churches and they would present a very powerful two-pronged attack against Paul. Number one, they would accuse him of being a self-appointed apostle because he was not among the twelve <laughs> and that's why if you read his writings you'll notice he always begins with I Apostle Paul chosen by God not by men and we'll see that as we open the book of Galatians the second attack he they made against Paul and this is the, the main one is they said that what Paul is preaching, salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, because of Christ alone, is not what the brethren in Jerusalem are preaching. He is not preaching the full gospel. God expects you to do something towards your salvation. And they came up with this idea that we are saved by grace plus circumcision or keeping the law or good works. And this was the first major issue, the first major controversy in the Christian church. The issue of women's ordination came in later. <laughs> okay, much, much later. So please turn your Bibles to Acts 15. I want to show you how they dealt with this first issue. Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15 and, and in verse 1 we read and certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren 
they came down to Antioch and taught the brethren. So the members, the, the people they talked to were Gentiles. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be what? Saved. The issue is not just circumcision. The issue is you cannot be what? Saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. In other words, if the apostles in Jerusalem, Peter, John, and James, and all the others, agreed with the Judaizers, they would be opposing Paul. And I don't think the Christian church would have survived. But listen what happened. Verse 3, So being sent on their way by the church, and then they passed to several places. And verse 4, And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all things that God had done with them. So you can, in a sense, look at Jerusalem as the headquarters, okay? And this is where Peter, Paul, uh, Peter, James, John, and all the others were. Okay, now, verse 5. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed, so these were believing Pharisees, rose up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them, that is the Gentiles, and to command them to keep the law of what? Moses. In other words, it is not enough for them to be, just to believe in Jesus Christ. They have to do certain things towards their salvation. The word necessary means towards their salvation. Now verse 6. Now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. So this was the agenda. Only one agenda. It's a big issue. And when they had been much Disputed, I don't know how long it took. Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So what Peter is saying, I was the first among the apostles who was called by God to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. Verse 8, so God who knows the heart acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. In other words, these Gentiles, when they accepted Christ, experienced the same thing as Pentecost. They could, they could speak in tongues. By tongues, I don't mean gibberish, but the languages of diff, you know, that they had not learned. And now, look at the next verse. Verse Nine and made no distinction, that is, God made no distinction between us, that is, the Jews, and them, the Gentiles, purifying their hearts, please notice, not their nature, but their what? Hearts, by what? By faith. Now, therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe, now the we is the apostles, the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Was Peter on Paul's side or the Judaizer's side? Very clear, he's on Paul's side. Then all the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul, declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. Folks, I thank God that the apostles took sides with Paul. Because half the New Testament is Paul's epistle. Can you imagine what would have happened to the Christian church if the apostles were divided? You know? And... Uh, It would have been terrible. I don't think the church would have lasted, you know. Then turn to chapter 21 of the same book, Acts. I want to show you the three main things these Judaizers had against Paul. 
Three things. Chapter 21 of Acts, verse 28. Paul had returned from his third journey, and these Jews, mainly of Asia Minor, where Paul had worked, were in the temple, and James, the brother, you know, the James who was the leader at that time of the church, said to Paul, you know, these Jews of Asia Minor are dead against you. They think that you're against the law. And I'll tell you folks, anyone who preaches the gospel will be accused of being against the law. Why? Because the law says, obey and you shall what? Live. The gospel says, believe and you shall what? Live. So they seem on the surface to contradict. Although Paul is very clear, and when we come to Galatians 5, we will see that he's very strong in upholding the law as a standard of Christian living. But never as the means of what? Salvation. So verse 20, you know, Paul agreed. He went through the cleansing process. He took seven days. And verse 27 of Acts 21. And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, that is, his, against his own people, the Jews. The law, he's against the law, and this place, and furthermore, he has also brought Greeks, that is, Gentiles, into the temple and has defiled this holy place. You see, there was a barrier in the courtyard of the Jerusalem temple, which, by the way, archaeologists has found the placard that was stuck to that wall. And this is what the placard said. Any foreigner, meaning Gentile, who goes beyond this wall will have to blame himself for his ensuing death. In other words, no Gentile, even though he may have accepted Judaism, was not allowed to go beyond it. Because the Gentiles were looked upon as a bunch of sinners. I remember when the first, my wife and I first came to this country in 64, we came on the Queen Mary, which is now <laughs> rotting in <laughs> Long Beach. It's, it's, an, it's a hotel and a restaurant, beautiful place, but the bottom is rotten. And uh, there were about five rabbis on that ship uh, coming to uh, uh, New York for a big convention. And it took five days for the ship to cross the Atlantic, including Friday and Sabbath. So I thought to myself, I'm going to try and witness the gospel to this rebel. <laughs> and on Friday evening, just before sunset, I, oh, yeah, I saw one of these rabbis walking on the deck. So I went up to him and said, excuse me, sir, can you tell me when does Sabbath begin? Because, you know, we, we believe we kept the same day. And he just looked in front of him. He didn't even answer me. So I thought maybe he didn't hear me. So I repeated my question. And this time I saw real anger in his face. I mean, he, he was boiling with anger. And he just walked away. There was a sailor scribing the deck. And he came up to me and said, you did a terrible thing. I said, I asked him a simple question. What was wrong with that? He said, don't you realize that he's a Jew and you're a Gentile? He had just has had a bath to prepare for the Sabbath, and you, a Gentile, talk to him, has defiled him, he has to go and have another bath. <laughs> and he told me that on the ship, they have a separate kitchen, separate dining room, separate plates and forks and knives, only for the Jews. And I said, that's discrimination. No, no, he said, they pay extra for that. They said, he said to me, if you want that service, we'll do the same thing to you. I said, thank you. I'm quite satisfied with the food here. So they looked on the Gentiles as sinners. And this is, this is uh, the issue that took place in, uh, in Jerusalem, the first, what we can call a general conference. It was, you know, Jerusalem Council. The church that fell for these Judaizers was the church in Galatia. 
And every Adventist must study Galatians because we have a similar problem. Many of you have been raised with the idea, I must do my best and Christ will make up what? The rest. That's Galatianism. It's a very subtle form of legalism. See, the Pharisees uh, in the days of Christ believed in salvation by keeping the law itself, period. But these Judaizers believed in salvation by grace. They believed, but they also believed that God expected them to do something towards their salvation. And this was the issue. So they came to Galatia after Paul had left and they said to the members, we hear the apostle, no, then you call him apostle, we hear that Paul was here. And they said, yes, he brought to us some tremendous good news. And the first thing they would respond by saying, do you know he's not a genuine apostle? That he's a self-appointed apostle. And they attacked his apostleship in order to attack his message. And they, they said to him, you know, he told you that we are saved, you're saved by grace alone, by faith alone, through Christ alone. That is only part of the truth. God expects you to do something towards your salvation. And they fell for it. And Paul heard about it and he wrote this, the strongest, toughest letter he ever wrote to any church was his letter to the Galatians. I want you to turn to chapter 1 of Galatians and notice something very special. In fact, two things. Number one, please notice how he introduces himself. Chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle, not from men, plural, meaning a committee, nor through men, singular, by some, you know, Peter did not come to him. Peter said, you know, we need an extra person. But through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. So who called him to be an apostle? God and Christ. The Father and the Son. Uh, you remember when after the resurrection, after the Pentecost, the disciples said, you know, Judas has betrayed our Savior. Now we are only 11 of us and it, we have to be 12. And they had a committee meeting and they chose somebody who was physically with Christ and they chose him to replace Judas. There is no evidence that they asked God to guide them. <laughs> and I believe myself that that was never God's intention. That God had already planned for Paul to be the, to replace Judas. Uh, keep your finger in Galatians 1. Please turn to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Listen to these words. Verse 8. Ephesians 3, verse 8. Which is the next book. To me, this is Paul writing, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. That is what Paul raised. You know, and if you look at his, uh, uh, his conversion, remember when he saw this bright light, it blinded him, and he, they took him to a, a house, blind, for three days he could not see, and I don't think he ate anything. Because before that, he was killing Christians. He was persecuting, thinking that he was serving who? God. And uh, God comes to, to Ananias and says, look, there is a guy in that house that you need to go and put your hand and bless him and baptize him so that he can see once again. And his name happens to be Saul. And I can imagine Ananias saying to God, where were you all this time? Don't you know what he did to us? He's been killing all kinds of Christians and now he's come here to, you know, to kill us. And you want me to go and baptize? And God said to him, yes, I have set him aside for a very special work. And I'm glad and 
accepted that and went and baptized him. Now let's go back to Galatians 1. In verse 2, says, in all, he's saying, I was raised up, I'm an apostle, and verse 2, and all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia. So he says, this letter is not only for me personally, but all the brethren who are working with me. And that is, of course, you know, Barnabas, and they might have been Titus, the others we don't know. Verse 3 and 4 and 5. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sin, that is, Christ gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the shortest introduction that Paul ever wrote. There is nothing about, I praise God for your, your, for your faith, like he does in other churches. He's angry that they were swept aside by these Judaizers. So he goes straight to the point, which is unusual for Paul. You read his other letters, you know. The introduction is much longer. But look at verse 6. I marvel, I'm shocked that you are turning away so soon from him who called you to the grace of Christ to a different what? Gospel. Oh boy. Now what did he mean by so soon? We do not know whether this letter was written from Ephesus or from Corinth. It's one of those two places. And it could be therefore either one year after their conversion or three years after the conversion. So, so soon could be anything from one to three years. I'm shocked. And then he adds in verse 7, which is not another, there is no other gospel, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. Now, what is that perversion? Well, we'll cover it up, but I want this in the, as an introduction to show you the perversion. Uh, look at chapter 3 of this book and see what he wrote there. Verse 1. Galatians 3, verse 1. O oh, foolish Galatians. By the way, that word foolish is a very mild translation. The word he wrote is actually, you stupid Galatians. Very strong word, you know. Who has bewitched you or cast a spell on you? Now the who is in the singular, at least in the original. It's in the singular. Whereas the Judaizers was, were more than one. They were men, M-E-N, you know, not M-A-N. So there was somebody behind these Judaizers who were doing that. And that is the devil. So... Who has bewitched you? Who has cast a spell on you? That you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Now here are the two methods of salvation that you will find throughout the Bible. When Adam and Eve sinned, and they discovered they were naked, how did they try to cover their nakedness? Fig leaves. That's human effort. Did the leaves remain there for long? No, they dried, dried and they shriveled and they fell off. Did God cover them, their nakedness? With what? Skins. Where did he get the skins from? Animal sacrifice. So right from the beginning, you have these two approaches. And all through the Bible, you will come across these two opposite methods of salvation against each other. You know, we as a church, and, you know, and Christians as a general rule, have said very little, until recently, about the Islamic religion which is the fastest growing religion in the world today, including the United States. The Islamic religion is very strong legalistic, saved by works alone. You have to pray five times a day. 
you have to fast for a whole month, and I don't know if you call it fasting, because we were in Kuwait during Ramadan, you know. You become nocturnal during the, that month. You cannot eat anything, you cannot drink anything, not even your spittle, from sunrise to sunset. But boy, after sundown, they gorge. Because we were invited to a Muslim home during Ramadan, and boy, it was a banquet. And they told me they spend more money on food during Ramadan than the rest of the year. And in order to be holy, fully sanctified, they have to make a trip to Mecca. And once they make the trip, once in their lifetime, they are called Hajj, and Hajj is holy. You know, so please remember. And so, could it be, uh, and this is just a suggestion, could it be that Islam will be our greatest enemy in the last days? Because they are, are dead against Christians. We are infidels. And you know, one problem that we have is we are not afraid to tell the world our problems. You know? Most of the other religions, most of the countries, including communism, they don't tell what it is like under communism. But you read the Newsweek, the Times, you know, all the crime, all the immoral behavior, they see on TV or in the magazine. And they look at America as a Christian country. And that's the def If this is Christianity, they, are, they need to be wiped out. You know? So please remember that, you know, the devil will use anything he can to destroy the church. Okay, now, one more verse in Galatians. Look at chapter 5 and verse 4. But I want to lay the foundation for the whole book. Listen to verse 4 of chapter 5. You have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by what? By law. You have fallen from what? In other words, you cannot marry these two methods of salvation. You can never say, I'm saved partially by grace and partially by obeying the law. The moment you add anything, good works, law keeping, towards your salvation, you have fallen from what? grace. And that is why it is so important. Because here's, let me give you a little bit of historical background. About the time our church was established, mid-19th century, the Christian church was introduced to a new doctrine. It wasn't brand new, it came up in the third centuries, but the fathers rejected it. And this doctrine, which is very popular today, is called dispensationalism. John Darby is the one who introduced it, then others, you know, Maitland, uh, another theologian from England, and Scofield pop popularized it. Their main teaching is that from Moses to Christ, God placed the human race under the law. Now the word under means ruled by the law, and when you are ruled by the law, it says to you, obey, you will live, disobey, you will what? Die. Because this system failed, Christ came along and did away that, with that system. He took the law and nailed it to the cross and replaced it by grace. And this is the teaching that is very common today among other Christians. That is why when we defend the Sabbath based on the fourth commandment, they put us immediately under the old covenant. You know, I had a couple... Uh, well, I had a young man in my church in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, Bo in, uh, in Cuna, which is near Boise, Idaho. He was dating a young girl from the Church of Christ. They were both very dedicated Christians. And they came to an agreement. The boy said to her, we can't get married until you become an Adventist. <laughs> and she said, no, you can't get married. We can't get married until you become a Church of Christ. So they decided to have Bible studies from both pastors. <laughs> with the Church of Christ pastor on Thursday and with me on Saturday afternoons, on Sabbath. 
And this went on for three months. And the young lady came up to me and said, we have come to an impasse. I said, what's the problem? She said, the Sabbath. What my pastor is saying about the Sabbath makes good sense to me and what you are saying makes good sense to me and we don't know who is right. So we have decided that you two pastors hash it out among yourselves in front of us. Now I had not met the pastor before. So I said, sure. So we decided to meet on Saturday afternoon. And uh, I, I pulled the pastor one side before we began our discussion and I said, whatever we do, we do not fight. We are both Christians. I want you to give me a Bible study from the Bible why you're against the seventh day Sabbath and then I will respond to your Bible study from the Bible and then we'll meet again another time and I will give you a Bible study why I keep the Sabbath and you tell me where I'm wrong from the Bible and he agreed so he spent an hour to prove that the Sabbath keeping is under the old covenant Salvation by what? Works of the law. And uh, when he finished, I said, you know, I fully agree with you. But there's only one problem. I am not keeping the Sabbath under the old covenant. I'm keeping it under the new covenant. Salvation by grace alone. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some several texts. Number one, to show you that the law was never nailed on the cross. And number two, the Sabbath is very closely linked with salvation by grace. It has a redemptive significance. And I'll give you text from the Old Testament and the New. So I said, you have now something to study against me. <laughs> well, the next week, when we were supposed to meet a week, day before, the young lady calls me and says, you know, my pastor is not able to make it tomorrow. I said, fine. If he wants more time, that's okay. And this went on postponing, postponing for three solid months. I never saw him again. And then I noticed that this, this couple had broken up. So I went to my young man and said, what, what happened? What went wrong? He said, well, her pastor convinced her not to go with me. So I said, uh, what argument did he give her? Because she told him, and this is the argument the pastor gave her, her pastor. She said, he, he said to her, nowhere in the Bible will you ever find the term Seventh-day Adventist. But you will find the Church of Christ. You know, it's so easy to take a text and twist it. The phrase Church of Christ in the New Testament has nothing to do with the denomination. It's God's people. Adventists belong to the Church of Christ, you know. And he said to her, if you join that church, I can guarantee you, you'll be lost. And out of fear, they broke up. She refused. Isn't that sad? Because he knew. Now, the phrase you'll come across in, in Galatians quite a bit, the phrase you will come across quite often is something I need to explain. Works of the law. It is this statement that got Paul into trouble because the Judaizers were taking that statement out of context. Let me give you an example of it. You know, look at chapter 2. And this is a statement that Paul had made to Peter when he came to Antioch and left the table of the Gentiles and went to the Jews. But he's repeating what he said to Peter. Chapter 2 of Galatians, verse 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Do you notice? Works of the law versus faith in Jesus Christ. Even we, that is you, Peter, and me, Paul, have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of what? The law. For by the works of the law, how many will be justified? No flesh, but no person. Now, there was no word in the Greek language, which is what the New Testament was written by, in Paul's day, equivalent to our English word legalism. So whenever you come across the phrase works of the law, it's 
synonymous with our English word legalism. That is, using the law as a means or as a method of salvation. God never gave the law as a means of salvation. And when we come to chapter 3 of Galatians, Paul will explain why God gave the law, at least the primary reason. Paul will uphold the law as a standard of Christian living, but never as a contributing factor towards our salvation. So Paul is angry with this church. Now go back to chapter 1. And look at verse 8 and 9. And look at these strong words. Chapter 1 of Galatians, verse 8 and 9. But even if we, that is, we apostles, or an angel, from where? So does it include the three angels of Revelation 14? Yes. So even if we, or an angel from heaven, first, second, or third angel, preach any other gospel to you than what we, that is, we apostles have preached to you, let him be what? Cursed. The word he uses, anathema, cursed by God. And he repeats that in verse 9. As we have said before, so now I say again. If anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be what? A curse. And verse 10. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a born servant, a slave of Christ. Now let me explain to you. And this is a problem that all pastors face. Especially these days. See, when you go to a church, when you pastor a church, you will notice that in most cases, not all, but in most cases, there is division over what is the gospel. Or there is some other division, you know. When I went to the church in Washington, D.C., oh, there was a big issue. There were two small churches, they were big before, but now they are reducing in size, that were dying. And the Potomac Conference could not have, did not have enough budget to give each church a pastor. So they decide to unite these two churches. What's the difference? One was Capital Memorial Church, which was all white, would never allow any black person to come to that church. In fact, one guy told me that when he came, he was told, I'm sorry, your church belongs up there. <laughs> and was kicked out. The other church was an African-American church, but there were a lot of West Indies too, West, uh, you know, that were black. And these were mainly educated, you know, people who had formed this church. Called, it was called the Brotherhood Church. And the conference decided to unite those two, which was not a wise thing. They should have closed one church down and said, you join whatever church you want. But they did not. They decided to join the churches. And the issue was so great that the, my predecessor decided to go to another church. He said, I can't pastor this church. The faction is too great. So they asked me to come. <laughs> What a joy. <laughs> and both sides came to me, both sides, and said to me, which side are you going to take? And they all had, you know, what they felt was valid reason. The, the whites accused the African American of being too loud and saying, our man, <laughs> sometimes the wrong place, you know, and their singing is very different, you know. And the African American was saying, look, these whites, they are like ghosts. They keep sit down in the pews <laughs> without any response. And both had a point, you know. So they said, which side are you going to join? And I said to them, neither. I'm going to join the side of Jesus Christ, where there is no male, no female, no Jew, no Gentile, no black, no white, but we are one in Christ. Yeah. You know, we had this same issue in Ethiopia. But this time it was not black and white. It was between missionaries, God workers, and the national pastors and workers. And they were fighting like cats and dogs. Because we had created a problem in the mission field. Thank God it's now cleared. We had two policy books. One for missionaries, section two, and one for national, section one. Different wage scales, you know, different rules and things. And of course, 
the wage scale was very different. In fact, they are facing the same issue today in South Africa. You know, we have two different conferences in South Africa. And they have a much more difficult time to unite because the wage scales are different. If they were to unite, the whites would have to lower their salary and the blacks would have to increase their salary to be equal. And you create another problem. The South African black pastors would be earning much, much more than their members were earning. So they were way up there, you know. So it's creating a big gap. So and they're still fighting now. I don't know what the solution is. But what happened is this, that uh, when I arrived in Ethiopia, I was born in Africa and I'm a missionary. <laughs> and the president said to me, you belong to both camps, can you solve the problem? And I said, no, that's not the solution. There is no human solution. The gospel is the solution. So I brought the two groups together, the missionaries and the national workers. And I said to them, I give them for several texts, the main metaphor used in the New Testament, the main metaphor, which you won't find in the Old Testament, all the others you can find in the Old Testament, but the only metaphor used in the New Testament for the Christian church is the body of what? Christ. The body has many members, but only one what? Body. And only one head, Jesus Christ. So I gave them several texts. I gave them a study on the phrase, the body of Christ. That the church is an extension of Christ. He is the head, we are the what? Body. Then I said, I turned to the nationals first and I said, look, when a person steals, what part of the body does he use to steal? And they said, the hands. When they are caught, how are they punished? What method is used to punish them? You know? And uh, of course, the, being the Orthodox Church, they use a biblical method. 40 strokes but one. That is 39, they make the guy bend over a, a table and they flog him with a horse pipe 39 times so he can almost, he can hardly sit. So I said, why should the sitting department be punished for the mistakes of the hands? And they said, well, it's one body. Ah, so we are one body. So when you missionary see mistakes with the national, please, it's, you're part of the mistake because we are what? One body. And when you National see mistake with the missionaries, and both sides made mistakes. Please, those mistakes are yours too. So once you identify this yourself with the mistakes of each group, the fighting will stop. Because you will never find your hands and your legs fighting. You know, I used to play soccer, you know, in, when I was young. And in those days, we could not afford soccer boots. They were very expensive. So we played barefooted. And one day, I hit a stone, <laughs> ripped my nail off. You can imagine how painful that is. And my, my head sent a message to my hands. Please go and help the hands. It's suffering. What would happen if my hands said, look, I'm clean. Those feet are dirty. Why should I dirty myself? Can you imagine what would happen? The body is a unit because it has only one head. And so please remember that in the church of Christ, there is no male, there is no female, there is no Jew, no Gentile, no black, no white. We are all one in what? Christ. And that's the greatest evidence we can give the world, that we are one. Do you know it took me three solid years to unite that church. I preached the gospel from every angle <laughs> until it hit them. And when I left, we had 43 nationalities perfectly united in the body of Christ. There was no longer capital memorial brotherhood. That was gone. And the reason why it was called capital memorial because it is in the very heart of Washington, D.C. And Alan G. White made a statement to the brethren many years ago. We need to have memorials of present truth in the capital of our nation. And it was this statement that led to the introduction of this church, Capital Memorial. So we kept the name Capital Memorial because of the statement Ellen G. White made. And that we were supposed to be a witness to this nation, Capital. 
So I had the privilege for eight years to have a Bible study every week, every Wednesday at the World Bank. You know? And you know, God was, it's amazing how people were shocked that Adventists could preach the gospel. <laughs> so going back to Galatians, Paul is saying that I'm not only really shocked at the way you have turned away from Christ and Him crucified, but that if you accept this perverted gospel, you will be cursed, along with the guys who have perverted it. Now I want you to see the distinction between the Judaizers and Paul's message. So keep your finger here in chapter 1, go to chapter 6. Where he's, you know, he's now coming to a conclusion. Chapter 6 and verse 12. As many as desire to make a good show in the flesh, and the word flesh means a human nature, a human effort, human ability. As many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these would compel you to be circumcised only that they may not suffer the persecution, the, sorry, suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. In other words, when you do something to be saved, you tend to put others down. Let me give you an example. Have you ever heard people say, you know, we are the ones who truly obey the law. The other Christians, they have only nine, but we keep all ten. Does that sound familiar to you? You older folks, thank God we don't do it these days. Are we better than the other Christians? No. But we have given the impression. And that's exactly what the Pharisees did. Self-righteous. And so Paul is saying, those who force you to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses, you are better than the other one. Churches. Now look, the same chapter, look at verse 14. Look at Paul's response to that. Chapter 6, verse 14. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. In other words, the only thing I will glory in is the cross of what? Christ. That's why I'm glad that this year the theme of the camp meeting is the power of the cross. See, the Paul... Preaching the gospel and preaching the cross is identical. Uh, keep your finger in Ephesians 1, Galatians 1. Let me give a text. This is in Corinth, Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Look at verse 17 and 18. 1 Corinthians 17, chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. Now remember, Paul was the greatest evangelist of the New Testament time. So listen to this. Chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, verse 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize. Can you imagine evangelist saying that? <laughs> but to what? Preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, that is human philosophy, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. Verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to whom? To those who are perishing. But to us, that is us Christians, who are being saved, it is the power of God. And then you go down, you know, to verse 22, down from verse 22, same chapter, verse 22. For Jews request, request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block, because it represents the curse of God, and we'll cover that in the 11 o'clock studies, and to the Greeks, that is the Gentiles, foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Gentiles, Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Folks, the cross is the central message of the New Testament. And for you Gentiles, you, you Galatians, to turn your back on it is foolishness. Okay, now going back to chapter 1. But before I do, I need to ask a question. What time is this class supposed to finish? You know, I don't see a... 
Five or five thirty. I've heard both. What time is supper? That may help. Okay, what time do you want? You want me to finish? <laughs> oh, don't know. <laughs> Because the letter I received is one and a half hour. That's what the letter, my letter says from the conference. So we'll compromise. Yeah, we, see, it doesn't say when it finishes. I know when it starts. No, but this is when, when the next things are done. So yeah, but when does it, it says, I don't know, it, it doesn't give me, see, before, the last one bulletin had the times when is supper, so and so time. Yes, the, the class begins at four, but when does it end? That doesn't tell you. I'm just telling you what the letter wrote to me. So we'll compromise. How about quarter past five? Okay? Then you'll have time to go to the cafeteria. Okay. Once he has made his point about the way the Galatians... Had to, beginning verse 11 to the rest of chapter 1... Paul begins to defend his apostleship. Now, he's not fighting for his rights, okay? He's defending his apostleship because it is linked with the message he was preaching. If he was not a genuine apostle, if he was a self-appointed apostle, obviously his message was also not from God. So he's defending his apostleship in order to defend his message. Okay, let's look at verse 10. But I make known to you, brethren, talking to the church in Galatia, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to men. In other words, I was not taught this gospel from men. No human being, no human being. For I neither received it from men, nor was I taught it. But it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, when I was converted on the Damascus Road, I did not go to the brethren in Jerusalem and say, please, can you give me some Bible studies, what the gospel is all about? No, he did not do that. He did not go to college, okay? Look what he did. For, verse 12, For I never received it from men, nor was taught it, but it came through the revelation of what? Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to add to that a text. It is found in 2 Corinthians 12, 7. We don't have time to read it, but I'll tell you what it says. Because of the many revelations that Christ gave me, I was in the danger of my head swelling. So God allowed a thorn in my what? Flesh came from Satan, but allowed by God to keep me humble. And I once read a statement from Ellen G. White, and she wrote that God showed me, at least the angel showed me, that I was in danger of my head swelling. <laughs> and because of that, God said to her, I will always, when you, the moment, even subconsciously, you begin to get proud, I will strike you with sickness. And she was sick all her life. You know, we human beings <laughs> have a problem. You know, our heads swell very easily. So God has to remind us constantly that you are, and I think that's why he made us out of the dust of the earth. So whenever you see yourself in the mirror, please remind yourself, you are made from dung, from mud. Okay? And you know, in different parts of the world, I like some of the terms. In Uganda, the word of this mud is mfufu. In, in Swahili, it's dongo, similar to dung, you know. And in Ethiopian, it's kushasha, rubbish. So remind yourself that we are made of mud. What's good about us is that what we are in Jesus Christ. Okay, so Paul is saying, now he gives his, his explanation. Verse 13, for you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism. How I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. I mean, you're all familiar with my history. 
It's not hidden. Verse 14, and I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceeding zealous for the traditions of my fathers. Do you know he was the youngest member of the Sanhedrin? And he had risen to the very top. But now look at verse 15. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace. Please notice, God had a plan for Paul even before he knew it. From the, even before he was born. Do you know the name of Paul before his conversion? Saul. Saul. Why did his parents give that name? Because the first king of Israel, name was what? What tribe was Saul? Ben he was from Benjamin. So was Paul. So when he became a Christian, he took the Greek word name for Paul, which means little. Before I was number one, but now I'm what? Little. You know, that's wonderful. Verse 16. Oh, let's read verse 15 and 16 together. Because it's, it goes together. But when it pleased God to sep who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. Nor did I go to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went to where? Arabia and return again to Damascus. Now, folks, the Arabia here is not Saudi Arabia, okay? It is only a few miles south of Damascus. The, the ruler was Aritas, you know, so it, it is not, so please don't confuse Saudi Arabia, you know. That's a long way from Damascus. It's just on the boundaries of uh, Damascus. So he went to Arabia, and by the way, how long was he there? Three years. Did Paul know the Bible inside out? Yes. What his problem was, it was interpreting the, the Bible correctly. Do you know, as a Pharisee, do you know how old a Pharisee's child is introduced to the book of the law? At the age of two. You know the parents, and say, how could a child of two learn the, the Bible? No, no, no. They smeared honey on the scroll of the law and made the kid lick it so that the law would become sweet as what? Honey. We call that bribery and corruption. And by the age of 12, which is boyhood, they were required to memorize the whole of the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. You know, I took a week of uh, prayer. Not, it was a camp meeting, actually, in Waco, Texas. Do you know what happened at Waco? <laughs> and they told me about a guy called David Koresh. He was the member there. He was baptized at the age of 10. And he had memorized the first five books. He had a photographic memory. He had memorized the first five books of the Old Testament. His interpretation was the problem. By the age of 19, he had memorized the whole of the Old Testament. Don't ask me how he did it. He had a photographic memory. You know, when he read something, it just stuck there. At the age of 19, after he had memorized, he had fornication with one of the eldest daughters. And he was brought before the board. And he defended himself. You know how he did it? He proved from the Old Testament that when something like that happens the guilty party was to pay a certain amount of money to the father of the child and be set free. And he worked it out how much it was in dollars. And he said, I'm willing to pay this amount to the eldest, the, uh, the father of the daughter and you are supposed to set me free. <laughs> and the board said, nothing doing. So they disfellowshipped him. Then he went to the Davidians and joined them. 
And because of his tremendous knowledge of the Bible, he and the leader got into trouble. They, got, they began to fight because, and the people respected David more than the leader because he knew the Bible inside out. And so he formed his own group and even one day said to them that one of these days you will see the Shekinah glory, glory around me. And what he did in that camp is terrible. He slept with the wives of, the, of, the, of his members, the people there. And I spoke to a young girl who left him just before the, they were killed in the fire. He told his people, anyone who forsakes me, I can guarantee you, you'll be lost. And people would not leave out of fear of being lost. And she said, when I left, because I could not handle it, I really believed that I was lost. There's no hope of salvation. Thank God, God brought her back. So please remember that Paul is giving his experience. He did not go to, the, to anybody, not to the apostles in Jerusalem. What is this message? He went to Arabia and he was taught the true meaning of the Old Testament, that it pointed to who? To Christ. Remember the Christ with the two men to Emmaus? Beginning with Moses, he went right through the Old Testament and showed that how the whole Bible points to him. So verse 18, then after three years, that is after three years in Arabia, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and re remained with him 15 days. Now why is he mentioning that? Because you see, by the time the three years were up, he had a complete knowledge of God's total counsel on the gospel. And he said, what I received from Christ, no human being could teach me in 15 days. So, you know, so he mentions 15 days because there was no way he could have learned what he's been writing and teaching in 15 days, in two weeks. And then verse 19, but I saw none of the other apostles except James, the brother of John, uh, the Lord's brother. Now concerning the things which I write to you, indeed before God, I do not lie. Afterward, I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and that's where his homeland. He went back to his home country. And I was unknown by face to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ, that is the Christian church in Israel. But they were hearing only, he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they glorified who? God in me. Folks, that is why we need to understand this book. And in closing, I have just a few more minutes. I want you to listen to Paul's own experience, okay? Uh, about, his, about his understanding of the gospel. Uh, we will deal with it in more detail from tomorrow onwards, but please turn to Philippians, which is a prison letter, and he loved the church in, in Philippi because they were so responsive. In, Phil, in Philippines, uh, Philippines uh, chapter 3, Philippines chapter 3, beginning with verse 3, chapter 3 of, the, of Philippines, verse 3. For we, talking to Christians, are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in what? In the flesh. Now, if you read Paul, you'll notice he gives circumcision a dual definition. To the Jews, circumcision is removing some part of your flesh. And he identifies that with legalism. A true person who is circumcised is one who removes unbelief that is in his life. Because you see, Abraham did not have enough patience with God. So 10 years after God had promised him a son and no son came, his dear wife said, Abraham, I don't think God can give you a son through me. You need to help him. 
I suggest you go to my slave servant, Hagar, use her as a surrogate mother, and please help God to produce a son. And like a good husband, he obeyed. And produced Ishmael. And God said, he said to God, you promised me a son, I helped you do what? Have you got the idea? You and I together. I plus who? Christ. And God said, nothing doing. God waited 13 more years. Sarah had now passed the age of childbearing. And God comes to Abraham at the age of 99 and says, do you believe I can still keep my promise? <laughs> Abraham said, yes, God. And God said, I'm tired of your unbelief going up. I want to remove your unbelief completely. And circumcision was to remove unbelief. It was the seal of righteousness by faith. Look at Romans 5, 4 verse 11. You'll find it there. Okay. So, going back to Philippians. Paul is saying, a true Christian rejoices in who? Christ Jesus. And have no confidence in who? The flesh. What did he mean by the word flesh? Not the soft part of our bodies. He explains in verse, verse 4, 5 and 6 what he meant by the word flesh. Verse 4, though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I am also. What's the evidence? Verse 5, circumcised the eighth day. The law of God says not only the male child should be circumcised, but it gives specifically which day, the eighth day. So I'm not only circumcised, but I was circumcised exactly as the law says, the eighth day. Number two, I'm of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, that is, I'm a genuine Jew, no Gentile blood in me. And concerning the law, a what? Pharisees. Now, you know, we look down on the Pharisees, but I'll tell you what, the, the word Pharisee means separated ones. They leave, they don't mix with the other Jews. They cut, the, they separate, and they keep every minutiae detail of the not only the Torah, the five books of the Old Testament, but all the rules that their rabbis had made. They keep all the rules. And I was one of them. In other words, he was living today, he would say, I was a holy Joe. But let's go on. Concerning zeal, verse 6, that is zeal for God, persecuting the what? Now what he was doing was terrible. But in his heart, he believed he was serving who? And God looks at the heart. God knew his heart was good. Even though what he was doing was terrible. And then he says, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, he was what? Blameless. Man, what a pedigree. So what did Paul mean by the word flesh? Anything that is true about you can be your birth, it can be your lineage, it can be your performance. So when you, if you come to me and say, I'm a fifth generation Adventist, does it make you better than the person who just joined the church? You know what I would respond? Nowhere in the Bible do I find that God has grandchildren or great-grandchildren, only children. <laughs> or if you say to me, like one man did, very interesting in California. He's the great grandson of Alan G. White. He actually left the church, got into drugs and all kinds of terrible things, and some sometime later God brought him in to the grace of God. You know, and if he said, "I belong to God because my great grandmother was Alan G. White," no way. You know, we think that the church cannot do without us. Folks, God doesn't depend on you. He depends on the Holy Spirit to finish the work. He uses human agents. All he wants us is to humbly... So Paul is saying, by the word flesh, anything that is true of you as an individual, can be your birth, heritage, you know, your background, anything that you are depending wholly or partially for your salvation. 
And Paul was one of those who believed in his performance. But now look at verse 7 to 9. I like that. But what things were gained to me? That is, as a Pharisee, he thought all those things he did would take him to heaven. But what things were gained to me? These I have counted loss for who? Please notice, he's not saying, I did 90% of righteousness, but I needed only 10%, so I, I, I went to Christ. Nowhere here does it say, I plus who? Christ. Verse 8, yet indeed I also count all things, that is all that he did, his circumcision, his pedigree, pure-blooded Jew, his perfect obedience to the law, all this. In verse 8, yet indeed I count all things lost, lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and counted them as rubbish that I may gain who? Christ. Now what does it mean, I suffered? Let us say for 20 years you've been working hard to please God by your performance. And somebody comes to you and says, by the way, what you did for Christ is worthless when it comes to standing before God. You know how you will feel? You mean I did these things for nothing? I mean, to give up all his self-righteousness was not easy. You know, in Africa, most of the soul winning, 90% of it is done by the lay people. Because the pastors have 8, 10, 15 churches. But they are not allowed to baptize. The pastor has to go and baptize them. And then he's photographed, you know, with the people he baptized. And it's in a magazine. And these lay people who did all the work, sometimes are not even mentioned there. So one day they went on strike. And they used Bible argument. They said, if Stephen, a deacon, could baptize, why can't we? And I asked them one question. Are you fighting for truth or are you fighting for yourself? You know? And they wouldn't answer me. Paul says, God did not send me to baptize. And he was the greatest evangelist of the New Testament. But to preach what? The gospel. Now let's look at verse 9 and 10. 8, 9 and 10. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. It's hard to count yourself right as rubbish. That I may gain who? Can you see? Not I but who? Christ. And verse 9, be found where? In him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God, by what? Faith. And then he adds in verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Who put Jesus in the grave? What killed Christ? And I will cover that in the 11 o'clock service. It takes three to seven days to die on a cross. He died within six hours. What killed him? The curse of the law. He came to redeem us. The wrath of God. The separation. When sin kills, how long does it kill? The wages of sin is what? For how long? But our sins could not keep him there. The resurrection of Christ is the greatest proof that God has given mankind, that his power is greater than all the accumulated sins of the world put together. And that power is available to you. But that's another study, okay? So he says, I want to experience the resurrection. I read verse 10 and 11 again. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, which is to sin, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Folks, I hope the study on Galatians will liberate you from any form of legalism that you will realize that we are saved by grace alone, through Christ alone. And through faith in Him. Let us pray. And by the way, 
I will give you time, you know, tomorrow onwards for questions, okay? And if you're afraid to ask me questions, write it on a piece of paper. Loving Father, we thank you for preserving this epistle to the Galatians that Paul wrote to a church that had sidetracked from the gospel and turned to a perverted gospel which is a mixture of I plus Christ. Lord, this is a problem that many of us face. Some of us were raised that way. And it has robbed us of the joy and the peace and the hope of salvation. We keep looking at ourselves. We see our failures. And we believe a lie from the devil who tells us that we are not good enough to be saved. We thank you, Lord, that you sent your son Jesus not to save the righteous, but to save the sinners, of whom we are all chief. So help us, Lord, to understand this epistle, that we may be liberated from any and every form of legalism, so that we may now be used by you to share with the world the matchless charms of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you tomorrow at 4 o'clock. Please read chapter 2 of Galatians. Okay, because it's a very important chapter.